Good morning to you all. I greet you with the words of St. Francis of Assisi, uh, the Lord give you peace. Father Bernardino and Father Celso have, an, have asked me uh, a contribution. Uh, I have divided it in two parts. The first part now, that is shorter, an uh, uh, introduction to the theme of the divine will in the Christian faith, in the Christian spirituality for all. The second part, a bit longer, in the afternoon, how um, Luisa Picarreta is very actual for the spirituality of all the Christian people in our time. But first, I must say two little things. I'll not say uh, something new, because I know Luisa from a few months. I have uh, uh, known many of you who know uh, sh Luisa from a lot of time. But I know that the Holy Spirit doesn't uh, make uh, new things, but makes all the things new. The second thing I want to uh, say at the beginning is that it's the first time for me in the States. I have arrived here last Thursday. So it's for me the first time that I speak in English in a country where English is spoken as a mother language. I have studied German. Thanks. So I ask your comprehension and patience. And I remember a famous Italian lawyer and speaker of the last century, whose name was Francesco Carnelutti. This Francesco Carnelutti suggested, if you speak in a public uh, meeting, stop when the people uh, start moving on the chair. So <laughs> So when you have enough, you can move a bit, and I understand. <laughs> I have said that this first part will be shorter. So the theme is the uh, God's will in the Christian spirituality as an introduction to the actuality of the message of Luisa. The first point. If you ask a normal person who is the man, if you're walking on the road. This normal person can give you several different answers. For example, the man is composed of soul and body, or the man is just uh, a, a material thing. The man is what he eats, and so on. But if you ask the Bible, who is the man, the Bible will answer the man is the, the, the divine will upon him. The man is that creature that God wants for himself. The man is that creature that as much become itself as more enters into the divine will on him. The man is his vocation. This means that there is something uh, only in the man among all the creatures, that is the human will. The man is called through his uh, human will to accept the divine will upon him. We are our vocation. We are the divine will upon us. This means two things. The first, the greatness of the man, because there is something only on the man. God wants to have a dialogue with the man, and only with the man. But the second thing is the uh, tragedy of the pity, because if with the, his human will, the man doesn't accept divine, the divine will upon him, there is the tragedy of the pity. Uh, the pity is uh, a damn not only for God and for the other man, but first of all, for the man himself. The pity 
is uh, something that I do against myself. The greatness of the man and the tragedy of the possibility of the pity. Second point, we need a savior with a divine nature, a divine person, but uh, with a divine will, the Lord Jesus, the blessed Lord Jesus, the Son of God, become man. In the life of Jesus, the divine will, the will of the Father, has been the center of his experience. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. When Jesus said the food, said that the divine will, the will of the Father, was absolutely necessary for him. The food is something that gives us the life, and that Jesus received his life from the divine will. The divine will was also for Jesus the purpose of his mission. I have come down from heaven to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The food and the purpose of Jesus were the divine will. All that the Father gives me will come to me, always the Gospel of John, and him who comes to me I will not cast out. During his life, the Lord Jesus has always searched the uh, will of the Father, from the baptism to the Gethsemane. He has always searched the will of the Father. We remember the mm, difficult moment of Gethsemane, when uh, at the end he decides to do the will of the Father. If you will take this cup of suffering away from me, not my will, however, but your will be done. I like to understand the resurrection also as a mystery of obedience to the divine will, not only uh, his mission, not only his cross, but also his resurrection has been for God, for Jesus, a mystery of obedience. I would like to say this because uh, you know that Louisa can wake up just at the order of the priest when early in the morning the priest came and celebrated the Mass before he um, gave this order to Louisa and Louisa woke up. So uh, we can imagine the resurrection as an order of the um, divine will of the love of the Father to the Lord Jesus. Also the resurrection as a mystery of obedience. But there is a place where the centrality of the divine will in the experience and in the example of Jesus is very clear, and is his personal prayer. There are two little words that can help, help us in understanding the importance of the divine will in Jesus. The first little word is, you know, the word Abba. That is an Aramaic word that means father, but not only. In English, we, you can say uh, daddy. In Italian, we say babbo, papa. A word that um, contains uh, this familiarity of Jesus with the Father. Only a son that is God could say Daddy to God the Father. The word Abba is uh, an important place uh, to understand the um, relation between Jesus and God the Father. But there is another word and is the word Amen. As you know, this is an Hebraic word that comes from a root. M and N are the two letter, letters of the root. 
um, this root means that God is as a rock. This root uh, um, means that the fidelity of God is uh, um, sure. And so the man can say he is a man to God who is the rock. A man means, uh, yes, I um, trust in God because God is as a rock. Probably not only on the lips of Jesus, but first uh, on the lips of uh, the Virgin Mary, is this the word that has been present uh, in uh, the moment of the um, conception of Jesus, when uh, the Virgin Mary answers the angel Gabriel, uh, she probably has said this important word in the uh, spirituality of the um, Hebrew people, Amen. Amen can be the original uh, version of the fiat of Louisa. And this fiat, this amen, has been on the lips of Mary and on the, the lips of Jesus. And in every liturgy, we say many times this amen. So the research of the divine will absolutely central in the experience and the, in the example of the Lord Jesus. But this research of uh, the uh, Father's will the obedience of Jesus was not the cause of a, a passive behavior. But on the contrary, the divine will was for Jesus the foundation of his freedom. He wasn't interested to the opinions of the people. Do you want to go away, you too? Remember to the disciples. The divine will was the source of the authority of the teaching of Jesus. The people said, we haven't uh, never heard someone teaching with authority as Jesus. And at the end, the divine will was for Jesus uh, the root of his majesty and of his peace. Even in difficult situations, the, the Lord Jesus has always maintained the peace in his soul because he was one thing with the, the divine will. Not only for Jesus, the divine will is central. Also in his teaching and uh, uh, for us, uh, the divine will has presented by Jesus as uh, absolutely central. We know that the divine will is for Jesus the foundation of the new family of the God's children. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. The divine will is also the contents of the prayer of the church. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the, the divine will is the criterion of authenticity of our faith. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So the God's will, the divine will, central in Jesus and in his disciples. But what is this divine will? Nothing other than the salvation of the human mankind. And we can say that the salvation is God himself, because there, are, there is not a difference between God and his gifts. The salvation is the divine will. And in the salvation, we can recognize two different aspects, a passive and a positive aspect. aspect. The, negative, the negative aspect is the uh, forgi forgiveness of the pity, uh, the mercy. This is the passive, the negative 
aspect of the divine will. But when he heard it, he said to the Pharisees, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I come not to call the righteous, but the sinners. And in the Gospel of John, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but uh, that the world might be saved through him. The mercy, this is the uh, negative aspect of the salvation, but there is a positive aspect. That is, that we can enter the divine life, the life of the Holy Trinity. Uh, through the Holy Spirit, we become sons in the Son, in the Lord Jesus, and we can call God the Father. We become sons of God. This is the positive aspect of the salvation. For Paul, the Apostle Paul, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You have received the spirit of sonship when we cry, Abba, Father. And also uh, John, the first page of the Gospel. To all who received him, Jesus, who believed in his name, in the name of Jesus, he gave power to become children of God. This is the positive aspect of the salvation. We enter in this relation that uh, belongs to the Trinitarian life. How the Lord Jesus has realized the divine will, the mercy, the forgiveness of pities, and uh, the entering, the offer of this relation as son with the Father? What has been the instrument through that the Lord Jesus has realized this divine will? This instrument has been the Holy Cross. We can't forgive this, even if it is not popular and not easy to accept. But the instrument of the divine will has been for Jesus the Holy Cross. What has been the cross for Jesus? It has been a necessary way. Several times in the Bible, in the New Testament, we can read affirmation as this. For example, in Luke, when the uh, Lord is uh, talking with the disciples on the road of Emmaus. O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Attention. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory and the letter to the Hebrews. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. It has been a necessary road for Jesus. For Jesus. It's true that the resurrection is the um, end of uh, the itinerary of Jesus, but the road to the resurrection has been the cross necessary. The Latin fathers was used to say per crucem ad lucem, that means through the cross to the light. Why necessary? Because the cross is a way of love. And when we really love, we know, we must prepare ourselves to suffer. When you don't love anyone, you will not suffer. But if you love someone, surely you must prepare yourself to suffer. Because to love someone is to offer our vulnerability to the beloved. 
because to love someone is to accept the possibility to receive wants from the person that we, lo that we love. This is the meaning of the cross, the entering in the deep of the mystery of love and of the suffering. In the Gospel of John, we read in the 13th, 13th chapter, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that this hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This has been the cross for Jesus. Love to the end. The cross has been the price of suffering that Jesus accepted to pay to remain in the love to the end. The love to the end has been the way of the cross for the Lord Jesus. And why it was necessary? Not only because each one of us, if loves, must accept to suffer, but especially because in the cross we see the revelation of the mystery of God who is love, because only someone who is God can love so much as the Lord Jesus has loved on the cross. On the cross, the Lord Jesus becomes the image of the Father. That means that in the cross we can understand that the mystery of the interior life of the Trinity is love. Only God can love so much as Jesus has loved on the cross. And now, some little criteria that I would take from uh, the experience uh, of uh, uh, Luisa. I know I have said that this is just an introduction to the second part, uh, uh, more about Luisa. But if the divine will is, is so central in Luisa, is because, first, there are the uh, bases in the Christian faith and the in the Holy Bible. And the um, research of the divine will is important for each Christian. So we have seen that the divine will is uh, the project of God on every man. We have seen that the divine will was the center of the experience of the spirituality, of the example, of the teaching, of the prayer of Jesus. We have seen that the divine will is the foundation of the new family of God's children, sons of God. We have seen that this divine will is the salvation of the man, the human mankind, and that this divine will can be realized just through the cross. So now we must ask us, how can we recognize the divine will concretely in our life? looking at the example and to the experience of uh, Louisa. I offer you some criteria. The first is the God's word. At the end, what are the writings of Louisa? They are a dialogue between Jesus and Louisa. And what is the Holy Bible for us, for all us? A dialogue between God and the man. You know, the private revelations uh, are under the God's word. And we can understand better the Holy Bible through the private revelations as the writings of Louisa. Of Louisa. I think uh, so that even if we are not Louisa, we can say that every time that we read the Holy Bible, God is talking to each one of us. I think that you have the experience that some texts of the Bible, or the Gospel, or another part of the New Testament, has a particular light in your spiritual existence, as if God is speaking to you and only to you 
in that part of the Bible. I haven't read all the writings of Louisa, but I have been surprised uh, um, see, looking at many uh, texts of the Holy Bible in her writings in a period in that uh, it was not easy for the lay people to read the Bible. So the first criterion to understand God's will in our life is the familiarity, is the hearing of the divine word. In the divine word, God reveals himself to each one of us, and each one of us has, I would say so, a personal gospel. St. Francis, for example, had some important texts of the gospel only for him. First criterion, God's word. Second criterion, to understand the, God's, the divine will in our life concretely, concretely, the church. We belong to the church. Of course, it's difficult sometimes to give obedience to the church, but Louisa has done always this. I remember also in the experience of St. Francis, the first thing that he has done when he had understood that something special the Lord was asking to him, the first thing was to go to the bishop. And Louisa too uh, wouldn't remain alone with the, her revelations, but she has given obedience to the church. In that moment, in the obedience of the church, surely Louisa was in the divine will. The first criterion is the criterion of the desires. We have many desires, desires of a physical level, of a moral level, eating, drink, and surely you have now the desire that I am not longer in my talk <laughs> and, I, and that I finish, and so on. But there is at the root of all the uh, many and many desires that uh, lead our life, uh, there is a desire with a, a great D letter, that is the desire of God. At the end, all we are looking for God. Also the sinner is looking for God, not in the right way, but he is looking for God. Our soul is thirsty of God. So it's important that sometimes we ask ourselves, but what do I want? What do I do in my life? What am I looking for? I want a new car, I want uh, to become this, I want... But at the end, we must answer, I desire God. This is the most important desire. And Louisa has lived just for God. She hadn't uh, money, she hadn't uh, important properties. She hadn't other things. She had only God. The poor is the model, is the example of the faithful in the church, because the poor is uh, the one who hasn't other things except God. And uh, in this sense, Louisa has been a, an example of poverty. But at the end, and I finish, the real, uh, the real important criterion to understand the divine will concretely in this moment, in all the moments of our life, is to look at uh, Jesus. Jesus is the criterion through that we can understand the divine will. Who is Jesus? He's the Lord, and we understand his mystery because he has loved us to the end. The Lord Jesus has been the brother among his brothers, the brother for his brothers. He has loved us for the first and to the end. So the criterion to understand that God's will in every moment of our day is to ask ourselves, but what had done Jesus in these situations? 
or better, if I can give you this final formulation, to understand the God's will in our life is possible if we ask just one thing. How can I be the one who loves most? How can I be the, love, the one who loves most? Not the other, not Father Francesco, not um, my pastor, no. How can I be the one who loves most? This is the way of the Lord Jesus. This is the way that uh, Luisa shows, and th this is the way that we must follow if we want to live in the divine will. I like to finish with some words of Luisa in the thanksgiving after each hour. Yes, O oh Jesus, I repeat to you, thank you, thousands and thousands of times. And I bless you for all that you have done and suffered for me and for all. I thank you and I bless you for every drop of blood you shed, for every breath, for every heartbeat, for every step, word, glance, bitterness, and offense which you endured. In everything, O oh my Jesus, I intend to sell you with a thank you and, and I bless you. Fiat. Amen. Persecuted for righteousness' sake.